The following recording is a short interview with Professor Richard E. Meyer on the role and design of video for learning. This was recorded at the University of California, Santa Barbara in November 2011. How did you get started in the area of instructional design and technology? Well, my uh, background and training is in cognitive psychology and um, I've always been interested in uh, learning and in particular um, how uh, we can promote transfer. So um, that kind of leads me to educational issues because I'm very interested in how can we help people learn in ways so they can apply what they've learned in new situations. So that, that's the classic issue of transfer that's been uh, around in education and in psychology for over a hundred years. It was really one of the in initial questions in the science of learning and also in, in education. Um, and so, um, in kind of looking at ways to try to improve transfer, uh, especially of, of kind of mathematical and scientific concepts, it kind of uh, drew me to looking at the role of graphics because we know a lot about verbal learning, but we don't know quite as much about uh, visual learning and how, how you can use visualizations to help people understand. So I, got, I pretty much got interested in um, how, you know, what makes a useful graphic, what, how can we help people learn? Is there a value added of, uh, if we incorporate graphics into instruction, will that help people learn better than if we focus just on words? So I call that the multimedia principle. And there's a lot of evidence that people learn better from words and pictures than from words alone, especially if you're interested in transfer, if you want them to be able to use what they've learned in new situations. And that obviously um, gets me into um, both animation and, and video because those are obviously forms of, of um, visual presentations. So um, I think that's why I kind of got interested in, in, in video and in animation and even in just still um, graphics because the, the question is how can we design graphics so that they can help people learn better. What do you see as the role of video and multimedia for teaching and learning in higher education? Well, you know, I think in general graphics um, are kind of an understudied part of the instructional scene and um, I don't think we understand as well about how to design good graphics, including video, as we do for how to just design verbal presentations. A lot more thought has gone into you know, how you lecture or how you write a textbook then has gone into how you design a good instructional graphics, animation and video, let's say. Um, but I, if, if you look at a typical instructional episode, a lot of the time um, is devoted to graphics, including video. So um, I think it has a very um, important place in, in uh, K-12 and in college instruction and in, you know, adult training in general. So it, I think uh, it has a, video has a very important place um, and what we need to understand is, you know, how to, <laughs> how to use it in, in the most effective way. So I, I, my, my approach is to try to take an evidence-based approach, look at what we know about how the human mind works, look at what the research has to say about how people process information and use that to design you know, effective learning experiences, including video. How might we best design video to achieve its learning objectives in a higher education setting? The way I look at this is that um, it's not really the media that causes learning, it's the instructional method that causes learning. This is a point that um, Dick Clark has made over and over again in the research literature that um, there, there's no research showing that one medium is better than another. We can't say video is better than textbooks or computers are better than face-to-face -face or something. Um, it's the instructional method we use. So I think we, we need to look at um, what are effective instructional methods for video that we can incorporate in video and, and are there affordances um, in video that are particularly uh, important? Does it allow us to have certain instructional methods that are more difficult otherwise. And, and I think the same basic instructional principles apply in video as would apply in, you know, any kind of instructional situation. So for example, I've done a lot of research on multimedia learning and I've developed um, 
oh, about a dozen principles of multimedia design based on um, experimental comparisons between one group that um, gets a pres one lesson and another group that gets the same lesson but with some feature added to it. So I kind of have an idea of which features promote learning and which ones don't. And for example, some of the main principles are the coherence principle, which is the idea of you know, keeping the presentation simple and focused. If there's too much extraneous um, material, uh, so in the case of video, if there's just too much detail that can distract people from the main focus of what you want them to pay attention to. Because we are limited in our uh, processing capability, we humans have a very limited working memory, we can only uh, focus on a few things at one time, it's important that we not overload people with too much going on on the screen. Um, so that's the coherence principle. Um, another principle is um, contiguity principle, that um, if we're going to have text and graphics, it's good to incorporate um, the text next to the part of the graphic that is relevant. So if we're going to have on-screen text that's superimposed on the video, it should not be placed as a caption. It should be placed next to the part of the, of the image that it's talking about so that people don't have to look back and forth. They can, the text is right next to where you should be looking. Um, and that same thing goes for a kind of temporal contiguity. Obviously, the, if there's a voice, it should be synchronized with what's going on in the video. It's not a good idea to just have somebody watch and then later describe what it was they were seeing. It's good to have the, the voice being talking about, talking about what you're actually seeing. That way people can more easily make a connection between the words and the pictures. Um, we can't really hold that information in working memory very long, so if we uh, have too much time between the words and the pictures, people will lose, will lose the details. Um, well, let me, what other examples? Um, one other um, principle of uh, instructional design that um, we have found in our research is what I would call the segmenting principle, which is if you have a fairly complicated uh, lesson, if the material is complicated, has a lot of different parts to it, it's good to break it down into seg kind of manageable segments rather than having one really long video that's trying to cover a lot of material. It's better to have shorter um, shorter sequences that uh, just kind of cover one point very well so that that's very well understood bef before you move on to the next one. So those are s some examples, what I call the coherence principle, the contiguity principle, and the segmenting principle. And we, we have, like I said, se uh, about a dozen uh, principles of that sort. What do teachers or lecturers need to know in order to be able to use video or multimedia effectively? Just making technology available to people doesn't work very well. We know that from the whole history of educational technology, of all, all the failed technologies that have been out there. Making it available is not enough. It has to be integrated into the instructional program in a way that makes sense to, to teachers. So, um, and that really gets back to the issue of good instructional design. And, you know, in the field of instructional design, you start with clear objectives, you know, you're really asking yourself, what do we want students to learn? What, what is the change in knowledge we're trying to promote here? And then we have to use video in service of those objectives. I think just saying, you know, here's some cool videos to watch, see, see, you know, see what you think, that's not going to be very effective if, if they're not directed towards the lear learning objectives. So I, I, think it's, I think it's always important to start with instructional design. It's not video that causes learning. It's, good instructional design and sound instructional methods that cause learning and video you know should be part of that design how should we produce video in order to increase the odds of it achieving its learning objectives for those who use it just based on other research in other areas i would think that it would be good to have a collection of fairly short videos rather than really long ones and that they'd be very focused on specific learning objective so it's clear to the learner what they're supposed to be getting out of this and I think it's also good to use video for, um, um, for what it's particularly good at which is I would say personalization so if we we want to understand okay um, Piaget's theory it might be good to get a short clip of him actually describing it himself um, because you could see he's a real person <laughs> 
and it doesn't have to be long, but it just kind of gets you to know maybe. And, and also, I think video is good for concretizing things. So you can explain forever, you know, what something, how something works, like how a pulley system works. But actually, seeing it in a, in a just a short video or even an animation is is really useful also. So I think there are particularly good ways to use video, um, and um, you know that's that's what I really want to focus on. And yeah, I, I know production quality is important, and I don't I don't really have a lot to say about that because that's really not my my area. But you could have really great production quality and and a completely ineffective lesson if it isn't designed, you know, based on pedagogical principles. So. To me, the number one issue is that it's pedagogically sound. Um, production quality is always nice, but somehow, you know, I think students learn um, from technology even when the production maybe isn't isn't perfect. If the actual instructional design is good, is there a way of bringing what we might consider dull academic content to life on video? How to specifically use video in instruction, I think, is a really interesting question, too, because not everything, we probably don't want to use it for all aspects of instruction, but for certain parts of it, it's, it's probably helpful. Um, even, um, you know, there's a lot of interest in these days in metacognitive um, uh, aids to learning, where you we want to kind of give students some, some strategic help about how, how they should look at something. And that's a place where video might come in, having a, a peer there explaining to you how they're thinking about what's being presented. That could be, you know, a useful use of video because it's, it's, um, uh, it's giving some credibility to this source and it's helping you think about y yourself as a learner. So, I mean, that's one, I, I really haven't thought about this before, but that's one possible use of video even in an online lesson or, um, to be able to the video be kind of just strategic help from um, figures who are peers, really. Um, uh, but yeah, I, you know, I think that's <laughs> that, that's the central question, really. How can you use video in an effective way? Is I think really what what you're what you're asking. What do we need to do to educational video so it engages learners? I think, you know, uh, yeah, there are two ways people go about that. Um, it's really how do you make instruction more interesting? And, and research on interest also goes back a long ways. I mean, Dewey has a book, you know, in the early 1900s on, on interest in education. And I, and, I, and I think his point is relevant to video because he really points out that you can add a lot of bells and whistles to instruction. So you could do this to video. You could make it be very glitzy and, um, you know, high production quality and very entertaining um, and a lot of fun, but, but that can all really distract from the learning aspect of a lesson. So if you, ha I mean his point, and I think it's still relevant, if you have to add interest to a lesson, that means interest is really lacking in the first place from the lesson. Interest should come from the content itself, not from some external um, uh, adjuncts <laughs> that you add to it. So you should start with a lesson that is inherently interesting to learners and that is understandable to learners. So I, um, I think Kinch calls that kind of um, what, what um, Dewey was talking about there, he calls that emotional interest. So you can make it emotionally interesting, but I don't think in education that's what we're going for. In entertainment we are, but in education we're going for what I would call cognitive interest. And cognitive interest comes from your ability to understand what's being presented. So being able to present things in a very clear way, in a concise way, so that a student can look at that and say, yeah, you know, I understand the phases of the moon now. <laughs> I never understood that before, but I, I see it now. I, I, it makes sense to me. To me, that's what that's cognitive interest. That's what I think we want to achieve with video and with any good instruction. We want people to be able to build a mental model that they can run themselves and, and you know reason with. So uh, so it gives them power. So they can they they can now you know think of new things. They can make predictions. They can you know master what's being presented in a deep way. So when you have deep learning, I think that's really what creates interest. 
So that's the kind of interest I'm, I would really like to focus on, not the kind of adding lots of glitz and color and sound and motion and interactivity. Those things don't necessarily promote learning. Um, you know, interactivity actually can, if students don't know how to use it correctly, can actually distract them. Um, so I would focus on, you know, making sure that the, the material is understandable and presented in a way where students are going to be able to feel like, hey, I get it. Should academic staff leave video and multimedia production to the professionals and focus on their research and teaching? Producing a educational video is a really multidisciplinary activity and it requires you know, people who are good on the production side and, uh, and understand how to, um, how to make a professional video, but it also requires subject matter experts and experts in educational um, design or instructional design and experts in um, um, even uh, cognitive, the cognitive science of learning. So I think it's, we need all, we need all of those fields represented in, in the development of high quality, you know, educational video. What three tips would you suggest for academic colleagues who want to support their students' learning over and above making their lecture slides available on a VLE? I think that's really commendable. And I, and I know on, on, on any college campus, there's always a, a small percentage of instructors who are interested in doing things like you're talking about. So I, I really applaud people who want to do that. Um, you know, I, I've been thinking about this. I mean, one thing I would suggest would be to start small and to um, look at how you can use just maybe short videos just as an adjunct or as part of your instructional overall instructional program, just how, how you can start to incorporate those. That's, I think, a less painful way to get, get into it and kind of, kind of get some experience with it. So that's one suggestion. And then maybe it's self-serving, but I also would, would suggest taking an evidence-based approach. Um, not just my research, although I think it's good, but, <laughs> but there's lots of research on um, multimedia design that's relevant to, to video. So, um, so some of the things I mentioned, you know, to keep things uh, simple and focused, to place words next to the part of the image that um, they're referring to, to break, break um, a longer lesson into smaller parts. Um, to, uh, the personalization principles to, is basically that um, Voice can be used to help personalize a lesson, and, and that maybe helps the learner feel more of a social partnership in the learning experience and would therefore make them try harder to learn. So um, I would say look at the research evidence on how to design effective um, multimedia and use that as part of you know, what you're doing. You know, view, view media not uh, and not as some sort of magic that's going to cause learning and you know uh, the idea is that it's again the instructional method that causes learning so uh, use, there's nothing magic about using video or using any technology it's kind of how you use it so you want to make sure that it's going to serve a specific instructional goal you should have a specific instructional goal in mind for why you're using a, let's say a, a video segment this interview on the role and design of video for learning with Professor Richard Meyer was recorded at the University of California, Santa Barbara in November 2011. The interview has been recorded and produced by Michael O'Donoghue at the School of Education at the University of Manchester, UK. This video is made available for viewing and use under a Creative Commons licence. See www.239productions.co.uk slash Meyer for further information.